Praise the Lord, everyone. Welcome to our midweek service, amen, where we get into the Word of God, find out what God has for all of us, amen. His Word is written for you and I to study it, to learn it, amen, to understand it, and for it to change our lives, amen. amen. Praise God. I love learning, and more importantly, I love learning the Word of God. Praise God. When you learn more of the Word of God, that draws you closer to God. How do we know that? Well, John 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. If you want to get closer to God, you just get to know His Word more, and that will bring you closer to God. Amen? Praise God. You may be seated tonight. So good to have each and every one of you here. I want to continue to talk, teach, and prepare us for revival. Look at your neighbor and say revival. Amen. What is revival? You've heard me say this many times, that revival and evangelism are different, but we use those words interchangeably. Evangelism is the proclamation of the gospel to the unchurched, where revival literally means, revival means when you and I get right with God and get right with one another. That is a revival. The church does need a revival, but the church also needs to declare the goodness of God to the unchurched, to the world, to those people that do not go to church. Amen. And that's what we are here for. God does not just save us to save us, but he saves us so that he can and we can spread the word of truth to anyone and everyone that will listen. Amen? Amen? So we will continue to teach, prepare the church for revival, getting us ready for revival. We must believe that God will bring revival. Amen? That's got to be something that we believe, something that we pray for, and that we're just going to trust that God's going to give us the revival that we are praying for. Amen. So let's continue to believe together, pray together, sacrifice together. And remember, prayer and fasting is always something that we should be willing and ready to do. Pray and fast. Amen. We know what prayer is. That's our relationship. Prayer is our communion with God. Right? Uh, what blood is to the body? Prayer is to the Christian. We must communicate. We must have a personal relationship with God our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and fasting. Fasting is important too. Fasting gets our flesh where it needs to be so that we do what God wants us to do. And we're going to talk a little bit about, amen, us drawing closer to God tonight through evangelism, things that we need to do to see great results. So starting next Monday, I've mentioned that we're going to be bringing more fasting to you. And again, I know... On the record, when we did our Daniel's fast, I just said that we were fasting from meat, okay? I did it on purpose because we're going to do variations of fasting throughout the summer, the fall, and into winter. Sorry, I said it, uh, but you know that we here in Wisconsin have four seasons. So winter will be here before you know it, but we're going to enjoy the warm summer weather, which is going to be upon us here in the next couple of days, right? I hear it's going to be in the 80s, possibly 90 degrees, 90s. That's, that's awesome. Amen. I try not to complain because it doesn't stay around for very long. Amen. So this next Monday, starting Monday, I believe that is the 7th of June. Are you ready for this? We're going to be fasting from sugar. Okay. Uh, that means all desserts. That means candy bars, cake, pies, any kind of dessert, okay? Uh, if you put sugar in your tea, real sugar in your tea, we're asking that you sacrifice, that you fast from sugars, okay? Not necessarily sugar that you would put in a, a, a meal, but yes, sugar that you would make a, bake a cake with. So, so no desserts of any kind, all right? Some of us are already revolting. Some of us have our arms folded. I'm just looking for somebody with their arms folded. I'm just kidding. So, um, but yeah, so we're going to fast from that. 
And it's, it's, a, it's a sacrifice, right? We're sacrificing that. We're making a statement, taking a stand and saying, God, we're doing this so that we can get our flesh under subjection, so that we can get God's attention, amen, that God can see our commitment and, uh, and hear our prayers and get us to the place where we will do what our flesh doesn't want to do. And that's what fasting does. It, it does help us to discipline ourselves. It helps us to, uh, to um, be temperate. The Bible says to be temperate in all things. And that begins by not giving your flesh what it wants. So continue to pray. That uh, Pray for the church office. Pray for your pastor. I've been making those calls Uh, i'm trying to figure out who our evangelists will be remember i've said it before our church this church is not ready for an extended revival okay um i don't want just a flash in the pan i don't want it to be said that well we put all this money that you sacrificially gave that we gave And then we look back and we just say, wow, that was a great preacher. That was a great speaker. What a great revival we had. We want to hear that, but that's not all we want to hear. We want to be able to be ready for this great revival. Not only great preaching, but great great discipline in follow-up, making sure that we got people to uh, teach the Bible studies, people to befriend these people, uh, and just involve them in our life. And that's where we got to get to. There's some preparation. As you know, that statement that I say a lot, preparation precedes the readiness to receive. Amen. So uh, that was what I needed to say before we get into our lesson tonight. Let's all be prayerful. Remember that we are people of purpose. Can I say that it's not about us? It's never about us. How do I know that? Well, to be a disciple of Jesus, the Bible says you've got to do three things. You know what I'm about to say. If this church knows these three things, or three things, you know these three. What is the disciple's creed? You must do what? You've got to deny yourself. That says it all right there, really. It's not about you. It's not about me. Jesus said you must deny yourself. Second, you have to do what? Take up your cross. You've got to identify with death, right? That means you've got to identify Jesus died physically for our salvation. We've got to die out to self. That's what the Bible says. We've got to carry our cross. Amen. We can't go places we used to go, right? We can't. We we identify with death because the Bible says we've got to mortify. That means to kill the flesh every day. Our flesh wants to do things contrary to the words of God. That's why we have to die to ourselves, die to our flesh every day. And then it says what? The third one, what is it? Follow me, okay? That's just as important as everything else. Because I've said before, we need to learn how to follow. Right? Everybody... I guess I'll say it. You know, it's probably not true necessarily. Everybody wants to be a leader, right? Everybody wants to be a leader. That's not necessarily true. But everybody wants to lead themselves the way they want to lead themselves. All right? Jesus said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. All right? And again, uh, this is why I asked you to download that app, The Chosen, uh, because this kind of uh, has inspired this lesson tonight. I was impressed when Jesus looked at people and he said, you know, follow me. That, think about what had to happen for them to literally follow Jesus, right? People gave up, they gave up their livelihoods to follow Jesus. Now, he's not asking for us to give up our livelihoods today, but he is asking us to give up some of our dreams, some of our hopes, some of our ambitions, right? Some of our fleshly desires, He's asking us to compromise some things. He's asking us to sacrifice other things. He's asking for balance from some of us. So we're going to get into this uh, lesson tonight. I'd like to entitle my thoughts tonight, Principles of Evangelism. Principles of Evangelism. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of John. John chapter 4. 
the book of John chapter 4. Thank you for being here on this midweek service. We only meet twice a week, Sunday morning at 10 a.m. and Wednesday night at 7. We only have two times to come together, amen. And uh, I believe that we're going to wish that we had more times that we gather together. Uh, the Bible says, do not forsake the assembly yourselves together, much as you see the day approaching, much the more as you see that day approaching. So none of us are really sacrificing giving God two times a week, right? If you come to prayer on Tuesday night, it's really not asking a whole lot. 168 hours in a week, right? And we're only giving God maybe, maybe five or six coming to church. And uh, it should be something we look forward to. Amen. John chapter 4 and verse 31 through 38. Scripture says, in the meanwhile, when I was reading this scripture, I, you know, I'm kind of goofy sometimes. You know what came to my mind, Brother Dan? Uh, back at the Bat Cave. That's what came to my mind. You know, I'm sorry. Uh, back at the Bat Cave, Batman and Robin. Um, I do apologize for that, but that is what came to my mind. Um, in the meanwhile, it is kind of funny. I'm, I'm funny. I, I'm, I'm an odd one sometimes. In the meanwhile, his disciples prayed him, saying, Master, eat. What? Brother Alden, what? Nice disciples, so concerned for their master. Isn't that just great? But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that ye know not of. Therefore said the disciples one to another, Hath any man brought him aught to eat? Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And herein is that saying true, one soweth, and another reapeth. I sent you to reap that whereon ye bestowed no labor. Other men labored, and ye are entered into their labors. That concludes our scripture text. We are not going to get to all those verses tonight, but I do want to, I do want to talk about the first few tonight. So let us pray, if we can, that God would just not only anoint me, but anoint our ears to hear, that, that, we would, that we would receive from the Lord tonight, right? And, and oh, by the way, by the way, I'm not just talking to the person next to you, okay, or behind you, okay? Um, I'm talking to every one of us tonight, and I'm always doing that, okay? I think that there is a problem the church can have, the 21st century church, is that we always think, the preachers preaching to somebody else, okay? That there's no way pastor's talking to me tonight, that, you know? I, but I want everybody to know that I'm talking to everybody. I'm talking to every one of you. Every man, woman, boy, and girl in the house that I can understand what I'm talking about, I'm hoping that you can receive. So let's pray, and I do want you to pray for the person next to you, Okay? But if you're going to pray for the person next to you, also pray for yourself, okay? Let's pray. Father, thank you for this wonderful Wednesday night. Thank you for the people of God. Thank you for the word of God. Thank you for the power of God. Thank you for God, the, uh, the, the revelation of the word of God. Thank you that God, our church, desires to honor you and to please you. God, we worship the way that the word of God says to worship. And now, God, we want to hear the word. We want to understand it the way that you want us to hear and understand. Help, Lord, all of us to receive. Help me to receive, God. Even though I'm teaching this tonight, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Everyone said amen. 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 Principles of evangelism. There are churches that are very successful at evangelism. And then there are other churches that are not. Great evangelism has little 
to nothing to do with where your church is on the map. Okay? It doesn't matter what denomination you are or what your fundamental doctrine might be. Every religion today has built and grown very large churches and followings. Just go and visit the South, and you will see that the Baptist, the Nazarenes, the Assemblies, and yes, Pentecostals, all have large edifices and great programs. Large churches with a bunch of people that attend. The question you might ask is, why are these churches so effective at reaching people and making disciples, while others remain stagnant year in and year out? The answer to this question is, the effective and growing churches are applying one or more proven evangelism principles they are actually applying the principles that we are going to talk about and we have talked about before. So there's nothing new here. I'm just going to perhaps say it, excuse me, say it in a different way. Maybe say it a little bit louder. Maybe with a little bit deeper of a voice. I don't know. It's not new, okay? It's what I'm trying to say. It's really not new and, and cutting edge stuff. Uh, you know, but it, it's, it's principles regardless of what you think of them, they actually work if you apply them, okay? Number one, outreach and evangelism must be the highest of priorities. Evangelism, outreach. You and I thinking about the unchurched must be our priority. It cannot just be about people in the church already. Now, Trust me, we're not here just for those out there, which is our highest priority, is sharing this beautiful gospel message to those that don't know Jesus. I'm not saying the church is not for the saints. It's not, the church is very much for you and me, the body of Christ, right? The Bible says that God gave us the five-fold ministry, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, for what? For the perfecting of the saints. That wraps it up right there. You're a saint of God. So for, for the perfection of the saints, for the work of the ministry, and for the edifying of the body of Christ. Okay? So we should be able to find everything that we need uh, in the scriptures tonight to back up what we're talking about. I mean, that ought to be the way it is when anybody gets in the pulpit at any church and preaches, right? So outreach and evangelism must be the highest of priority for a church. We as the people of God must do what Jesus did, and that is to be about his father's business, right? We too must be about our father's business, our heavenly father, okay? Souls were Jesus' goals. People were his focus. You know that, I know that. That's what I'm saying. I'm not telling you anything you didn't, you don't know. I'm reminding you. Souls were Jesus' goals. We cannot just talk a big game. We must do it, right? It's not that we cannot enjoy life, but we must not enjoy this life at the expense of those that are lost. Does that make sense? What, what do I mean by that? We can be so caught up in, 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 in everyday living that we fail or forget the very purpose and the reason why we exist in the first place. Because God didn't just save us from hell. Which if we look in scripture, again, I try to give scripture, right? I, I try to back everything up. I, I, I say it again. You know, the Bible says, broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, right? I'm kind of paraphrasing. It says, broad is the way and many there, many there go therein, Right? But narrow is the way, and straight is the gate, and few there be that find it, okay? So the Bible says that there is a broad way that many is just going to blindly follow, and they're going to be lost. But the Bible says 
Straight is the way and narrow is, narrow is the way and straight is the gate. Fewer are going to find that way. And I don't know what the number of fewer is, but we do know that, that we have our work cut out for us. Okay? We're not just preaching to alcoholics and drug addicts. We're, not, we're just not preaching to the down and outers, but we're preaching to people. We're trying to reach people that, have, that, that are not addicted to any kind of thing. That they, they, they have a great job. They make a lot of money. They've got life figured out. They're raising their kids to be successful, you know, assets to society. They got things figured out. They just lack the hope. They lack the understanding. They think maybe that, you know, that they're good people, so that saves them. But we know that just being good does not save you. Right? How do we know? Well, look at the story of Cornelius in the Bible. And again, I can't go there. I mean, that was just a teaser. But it's not that we can't enjoy this life. But we must not enjoy this life at the expense, at the expense of those that are lost in our world. We cannot ignore that fact, right? Souls cannot and must not be just a passing thought for God's people. Just can't be a passing thought. Or, or maybe it's not a passing thought. Maybe every day, Brother Dakota, maybe every day we think about lost souls, but we don't do anything about it. It's not a passing thought. We just walk by people every day and we realize, oh, wretched, they're terrible people. How sad it is. But we just walk by them without sharing or loving or caring or being led by the Holy Ghost to talk to them. You see, the salvation of souls must be the highest of priorities for the church. If not, then we are out of balance and not following Christ's example of loving the lost and being about our Father's business daily. Now in John chapter 4, in our text, I read it again. In the meanwhile, his disciples prayed him, saying, Master, eat. Okay, But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that ye know not of. Therefore said the disciples one to another. So Jesus just told them, Look, I have a meat. They weren't even, <laughs> you got to get this. Jesus told them, you know, they're concerned about him not eating. Maybe he looked famished. Maybe he looked tired, right? Somebody said, you know, has the master eaten? They cared about it. Has the master eaten? And then he said, I have meat that you know not of. They, then they ignored him, right? Then they said, therefore, said us, was one to another. Hath any man brought him his sandwich? I mean, did anybody get him a fish sandwich? Some pretzels, anything, you know? And then... And then Jesus says in verse 34, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. There is a simple but profound. When I begin to look at this passage, this begin to pop out at me. There's a simple but profound thought and principle to be seen here. And I believe that it pertains to you and I. It is easy to miss it or dismiss it. It's easy to miss it or dismiss it. You can see it, but you're going to dismiss it. But let's not do that. Please, I'm asking everybody not to miss it or dismiss it. I believe we need to see it, take it to heart, and work to better ourselves, to fix ourselves, and to take the principle and apply it to our life. The concern of the disciples here was, you ready? Here, we're getting into the meat of it. <laughs> you like that? We're getting, Brother Kurt got it. He's with me. Here's the meat of it. The concern of the disciples here was the commitment, everybody say commitment, between the physical and the spiritual. The concern of the disciples here was the commitment between the physical and the spiritual. And the spiritual, it's not a new problem, okay? This is still a problem today in most cases with the church. The commitment between the spiritual and the physical. Are you with me still? Yes? Somebody nod their head. 
Nod your neighbor said, do it, shake. No, don't shake anybody. Okay. Not a new problem. The concern of the disciples was for physical nourishment, not the spiritual nourishment. You can hear it. I heard it. I don't know if you can hear it, okay? You can hear it in Jesus' statement and the fact that he didn't dismiss it and go ahead and eat something at that moment, okay? Has anybody given Jesus his sandwich, you know? And Jesus didn't go, oh, yes, thank you. I'm very, t- I'm very, I'm hungry. Hand me that sub, you know? G- give, give me that pizza, you know what I mean? No, he didn't do that, right? So verse 34, again, Jesus said to them, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. If anyone knows we need food to survive, it would be God who created us to survive by eating food. But here Jesus points out the not so obvious to his disciples. And this is what the Lord showed me. I believe that Jesus was moved by his disciples' lack of being moved. I'll say it again. I, I love what I'm seeing on a few of you. You're, 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 you're looking in your, your, your word, the Bible. You're nodding your head. You're with me, okay? I believe that Jesus was moved by his disciples' lack of being moved. Okay, let's keep going. The disciples' minds were not on the woman to whom Jesus had just witnessed to in the previous chapter. If you go back, the Samaritan woman at the well. No. The disciples were not thinking about her. No. Not on her spiritual needs at all. Their minds were on Jesus' physical needs of hunger and their physical hunger pains as well. Seems to me like an okay thought, right? Because, I mean, God made me to get hungry. So their thoughts and their mind was on their physical needs of hunger and their physical hunger pains, not on the spiritual pain and the needs of those that Jesus was reaching. I think that this is where most of us live today. This is the teaching moment for us all. Too many of us are like the disciples. We are, a lot of us, are like the disciples here in our text. Very shallow spiritually. I I said it. Was that hard? Was that too hard? Are you offended by that? I believe that the 21st century church can see themselves right here in this passage, right? The disciples, let's, let's kind of walk it through again. The disciples were concerned about their physical needs. Like many of us are are concerned about too often, our physical needs, our physical desires, our hobbies, our work. I mean, you can fill in the blanks, right? Less concerned about the spiritual, more concerned about the natural and the physical, right? Too many of us are like the disciples, very shallow spiritually. We're not focused on the mission of the cross not concentrated on a world that is lost we are not looking for every opportunity possible to reach and help people for God when we leave on Sunday afternoon it's all about us from Sunday afternoon to Wednesday at 5 my time me This is my time. You see, we fit just right exactly where the disciples are. We're all about the physical, the natural. You see, Sunday and Wednesday, yeah, the church is like a hospital. If you're sick spiritually, you need to come to church and and find health and vibrancy again. But really, Sunday and Wednesday should be a celebration of what God did Monday, about what God did Tuesday about what God did Thursday, about what God is doing Friday, and about the people that you spent time with on Saturday. Now look, hey, I'm not pointing fingers at anybody because we're all in this together. I'm talking about preparation precedes the readiness to receive. Okay? We all gotta do better with this. We all gotta 
figure ourselves out. We all got to figure out if we are truly seeking first the kingdom of God. I can't get ahead of myself because I got a lot of, a lot of notes here, okay? Jesus' concern was focused on spiritual food and nourishment, and ours should be too. We must be more concerned with the spiritual than the natural. We must be more concerned with the spiritual than the natural. We get caught up with life and all the things that go with it and forget about the greater needs. It seems that everything is more important than what is actually most important. We get caught up in life, right? And all the things that go with life. And you and I forget about the greater calling. We forget about the greater calling that all of us have been called to. We forget about that greater calling. It seems that everything is more important than what is actually most important. Eating food to survive is an important thing. Yes? Yeah, we have to eat to live, right? But the disciples were not starving, and Jesus knew that. So the truth of the matter was... They cared little about what Jesus cared about. And you see, this is what I'm trying to help us with tonight. The disciples cared little about what Jesus cared about. He said that. You could hear it. You could see it. You could, you could just sense it. You know? You could just sense it in, 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 this, in this scripture text. And this is the takeaway for the church tonight. You and I cannot care more about our life. We ought not care more about our dreams and our desires than we care about God and the things of God. Can I get an amen? amen. And I know this is true. Because Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33 says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And everything else in life, it will it'll be figured out. Everything else in life will be figured all out. If you do those two things, if you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, God's going to figure everything else out, right? That just comes with you and I living right. The truth of the matter was in our story. The disciples cared little about what Jesus cared about. So here's the mic drop moment. Here's the mic drop moment, right? The will that must concern you and I, the will that must concern you and I most is God's will. The work that must concern you and I most is God's work. Don't want to throw anybody under the bus, but I'm going to, okay? Just, the reason why I'm pausing is I don't know if the AVL saw those two statements that I wrote in the thing that was, I was hoping that you could see those statements. And because they say when you hear and see things, you remember them most. So I, I, I just was wondering if they got it. But if, if, if they didn't, that's okay. Um, the will that must concern you and I most is God's will. The work that must concern you and I most is God's work. Does that make sense? We must learn from what we see here in the word of God. The physical, even though important, the physical is important, is it nearly as important as the spiritual? We should never put more importance on the physical than the spiritual. Even though balance is highly important in all areas of our life, seeking first the kingdom of God will never be a bad choice and is always the right choice. Did you hear that? Seeking first the kingdom of God will never be a bad choice and is always the right choice. Again, Matthew 6, verse 33 says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. And I believe that that verse can be the fix-all. If, if you need things fixed in your life, if your life is a mess, if your life is topsy-turvy, if, if, if you can't make sense of your life right now, I can promise you 
If you apply Matthew 6, 33, it says, but seek ye first the kingdom of God. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things shall be added unto you. Amen. Let's be reminded, no greater will, no greater work exists on this earth than God's will and God's work. I remind you that this doesn't begin at church. Can I remind somebody that what I'm teaching about, what I'm preaching about, does not begin at church. These kingdom principles begin at home. These kingdom principles are sought after and prayed for in our closet of prayer daily. Amen? If we want results, we can't just expect church on Sunday to do it. If, if we want great results, we cannot expect just Wednesday night to do it. Amen. That means tomorrow, Thursday, and Friday, and Saturday. These are non-church days. I'm going to go into prayer, and I'm going to say, God, help me. Amen. Help me, God, to seek the kingdom of God, your kingdom first. Doesn't the Lord's prayer says, not my will, but thy will be done, right? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God, i got to pray this every day. God, amen, yes, I've got a life to live. I've got a wife, or you've got a husband, you've got children, you've got jobs, you've got lawns to mow, you've got groceries to buy. You've got all those responsibilities. But none of that is more important than seeking first the kingdom of God. I've said this before. I'd rather my children be babbling idiots with no degree and be living for God and make it to heaven. I'd rather them just have a, be clueless. But if they love God, if they're in church, if they're serving the Lord, if, if that's the trade-off is what I'm saying... I'm going to take them serving the Lord versus them having a doctorate degree in something, right? They don't have to go to college. If that's the trade-off, don't go to college. Just live for God. Be sold out to the kingdom. Because I want to go to heaven. I want them to go to heaven versus them just getting that pat on the back that, boy, you were a great, you were a great employee. Wow, you're smart. You're intelligent. You're good with money. Wow. You got a, wow. None of that stuff matters. None of this stuff on this earth is going to matter when the rapture takes place. None of it's going to matter. Right? It's true. It doesn't begin at church. It begins at home. We must encourage ourselves daily to be about God's will and to be about God's work. It's not natural. Let me say that again. It is not natural. And that is why we have to go against the natural flow of our flesh daily and seek God's divine will and his divine work. This is the answer to personal growth, and more and more about church growth. We must believe in what we do and outreach with a passion for what we believe. It is said that the older churches are generally less effective. Hear me. People, churches that get older, you know, how long has your church been around? Oh, it's been around for 35 years. Church has been around for 50 years. They say that older churches are generally less effective at outreach than newer churches because longer, a longer a church exists, the more concerned members become with self-preservation than production, than reproduction. Amen. About self-preservation, you know, than reproducing. Too often a church can forget what they exist for. Amen. God help us not to forget what we exist for. Amen. This is good teaching. This is really good stuff because this world needs us, don't they? This, the people out there that don't know Jesus Christ, they need us. And, and lessons, uh, further lessons on, in this scripture text we're going to learn. Jesus said, you know, uh, you say four months in the harvest? I say, look on the fields. They are ready to harvest. Amen. And we're going to get to that. But the church must be careful not to become so self-centered and so self-serving. Because if it, if it does, the church will cease to grow. And it's important that, that we keep that attitude, that, that, that mindset, that posture that we, have, that we have not arrived, but that every day I'm seeking the will of God. Every day I'm seeking to do the work of God in my life. Amen? Amen. How do we shake 
things up so that we do not neglect what's most important. We must remember that it's not about us. It is about what Jesus came to this earth to do, right? To seek and to save that which is lost. We must stay focused on the original mission, Christ's mission of winning and making disciples, right? You're going to have churches, big churches, small churches, churches, church organizations. You're going to have different kind of administrations. They will go on. But the whole purpose is to teach the lost world how to live and succeed in a sinful world and teach them how to get from this world to the next. I read a statement that I thought would and could apply right here. Risk can be dangerous, right? Risk can be dangerous, but routine can be deadly. Yeah. Comfort has killed more dreams than daring ever did. Wow. As you've heard me say, that faith's twin brother is risk. The Bible says if we don't, even, if we don't have faith, we don't even please God. You can't please God without being a person of faith, without believing in the impossible, right? We can get into a routine that is like a, what they say, a, a rut. A rut is just a coffin without sides. To get in a rut and not get unstuck, that's why routine can be deadly. Comfort, being too comfortable. Comfort has killed more dreams than daring ever did. Amen? I'm going to stop there tonight. And not even get into our, our, my second point tonight. So it's very, very important that we, let's quickly do a wrap up on our lesson tonight. So the chapter before this, Jesus goes to Samaria. The woman at the well, right? Talks to this woman. She realizes who he is, right? Here's the Messiah standing in front of her. Beautiful story. Jesus began to tell her, if you knew who I was, you'd be asking me of, of living water, right? Jesus changes this woman's life. She runs off in the distance. Come, see, the man has told me all about my life, right? The disciples come back. Perhaps they, 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 they see this transformation, and all they're worried about, all they're worried about is lunch. All they're worried about is their flesh. All they're worried about is, the, is their stomach, right? So why did God give us his word? Why do we have the written word? The written word is, is to teach us some things, to guide us, to show us, to give us direction, to show us how to live our life, right? And Jesus said, I have meat that you know not of. Physical food is not important right now. Spiritual food is the most important right now. And the disciples still didn't even get it. They, 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 didn't even, they couldn't even wrap their mind around what Jesus was saying. And this is what the church needs to take away tonight. Is that our life does need balance. You can't live without food. But you also can't live spiritually without making God the number one priority in your life. Okay? You and I can't be effective. We can't, we, can't, we can't live the most effective spiritual life if all we do every day is continually worry about the physical. To continue to worry about the natural, okay? That stuff's going to come, right? I mean, who's going to work in the morning? Most of us are going to work tomorrow morning. Those of you that are retired, you're smiling right now. You're like, ha, I'm not, I'm not. I'm getting up and making me some scrambled eggs, you know what I mean? But the deal is, is we have balance, we have life. But the takeaway is this, is no matter what you're doing in life, no matter if you're retired or not, if we don't wake up in the morning, and if we're not thinking about God and the purpose why we exist, if we're not thinking about the spiritual needs of our world, if we're not praying for people that we come in contact with, then then. We are not living the life that Christ exampled. He was about his father's business. We must be about our father's business. We must shake ourselves and wake ourselves. It's not just Sunday and Wednesday that we need to be worried about. Those are, not, those, are, those are important days. 
Please understand, Sunday and Wednesday are very, very important. But what's even, I, I'm going to say it, what's most important is how you live Monday, how you live Tuesday, how you live Thursday, how you live Friday, and how you live Saturday. All right? Because coming to church, that's, that's a given. We're going to come to church. Amen. We're going to enjoy the beautiful family of God. We're going to be encouraged by seeing one another, strengthened by hearing the word of God, worshiping together with our beautiful music team. But what's most important is that you receive from God on Sunday, receive from God on Wednesday, and you take what you received out there to survive and you, and you use it. We can't just talk a big game. We, we got to step up to the plate. And that's what I'm talking about is preparation precedes the readiness to receive. Amen? Yes, do we want to invite people to come to our church? Yes. But what's more important, I said this, I think it was uh, Sunday, what's more important than inviting people or introducing people to our church is introducing people to Jesus Christ. Amen. So that, that proposes the last question I'm going to ask tonight. What has Jesus done for you lately? What has he done for you lately? Has it been a long time? Has it been a long time since you've had uh, him impact you spiritually? Is, is your life totally focused around your flesh? When was the last time you prayed as a family in your home? When was the last time you talked about, you know, being a light at home? When was the, when was the last time you talked about these things at home? Because certainly we've got to change those things. It's not just about Sunday and Wednesday. It's bringing this stuff with you wherever you go. Wherever you go. Amen? And having balance. And, and, and following God's example in his word. It's not all about the natural and the physical. Church, it's about the spiritual. It's about, it's about following God's lead through his word. This is a great scripture that we can take, learn this principle. Amen? That, that it's just, it's not, we, we, we get stuck in the physical and the natural, and we got to get out of that, and we got into the spiritual, amen, and be focused on the things that God wants us to be focused about. Why don't we stand tonight? So why don't we pray together? Why don't we pray together? Why don't we ask God? I mean, we got to take, I mean, I, I do this every day. I mean, most of us do. When we, you know, I, I pray the sinner's prayer every day, okay? I, I want to be sure that I'm, 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 I'm asking God to forgive me of, of sins that I've done, maybe how I've mistreated people, you know, uh, how I've acted, reacted. Uh, forgive, not just sins of omission, but, you know, those sins I've committed, those sins I, th things I should, should have done or sh shouldn't have done. And I, I, make my, I'm, I cry out to God every day, you know, in, in, my, in my prayer time. It's important to do that. But what's also important after you pray those prayers of confession is that you go to God and you say, God, make me into the person that you want me to be, God. God, I don't want to just be about the natural and the physical. I want to be about the spiritual. Amen? I want to be, I want to be about spiritual things. And, and God, help me to have a mind for you, a heart for you. Help me, God, to do your will and to do your work every day. Amen? That means you may have to change the music you listen to. You may have to change the books that you read, right? You may, you may have to give up a hobby. Whatever you have to do to, 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 bring, to bring balance into your life, right? And to begin to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, amen? Let's pray tonight in closing. Father, thank you for the church tonight. Thank you for the people of God. Thank you, God, for this, this uh, scripture, your word, that God that shows us, that God that, that we've got to be more about people. We've got to be more about the, the needs of others. We've got to be thinking about it every day, Monday through Sunday, God. And we're going to do it all again the next week, God, Monday through Sunday, God. I pray that, God, you would help us to, that's what I was talking about, God, that we, we got to take personal inventory of our life, God. We've got to look inward and see where we're at. And, God, make those changes, not just talk a big talk, but, God, we've got to walk the walk, God, that we will do the necessary change, the necessary things in our life. That we can honor you and please your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Well, thank you for being here. Thank you for listening. Amen. Thank you for taking the, the lesson and applying it to your life. God bless each and every one of you. And we'll see you back here on Sunday.
morning at 10 o'clock. God bless you.